nobody wants to host their own database. AWS isn't doing anything creative. They're actually just taking open source soft. Logic wise, we can do pretty much everything with these services. Nowadays, there's so many different cloud services that even just knowing the names of all the services that AWS offers is difficult, let alone understanding what they actually do. Well, the good thing is that I'm going to explain to you why most of the cloud services are all really the same under the hood. And I'm also going to be giving you roughly my top five services that you should actually understand and know. And everything else is just a repackaging of those top five. We're going to go even deeper than that and learn about the differences between managed and unmanaged services, because I think that's kind of a buzzword nowadays. It kind of gets into the whole meaning of what does serverless actually mean. We'll also touch on the difference between a regional and a global service, and we'll also be talking about all kinds of different cloud services and providers from the big boys like AWS, GCP, as well as the startups, Vercel, kind of the mid-sized companies like Snowflake, Datadog, and kind of talk about how they fit into the overall picture. Now, the single most important service to know and to know really well is something that you're probably already familiar with. You can, in a sense, rent a computer as a service. It's called a VM, a virtual machine. Now, technically, you might not be renting a physical computer, but you can think of it as that because you'll have resources allocated to your VM. For example, some CPU, some amount of RAM, disk space, which you can usually add on to. So from your perspective, you're getting a computer. Well, it turns out that pretty much every single service is built on top of this. Any cloud service you're gonna use is in a sense built on top of VMs. If you wanna run some type of compute or server, it's gonna be running on top of some type of machine using some CPU and other resources. If you wanna store a bunch of files, it's gonna be stored on top of a computer because even though the files are gonna be stored probably on disk, well, to read and write to those files, you're going to need some type of computer. To run a database, I probably don't have to tell you, it's going to require all of these. Everything is just built on top of computers. And pretty much every cloud provider will offer something like this. Amazon has EC2, Google has Compute Engine, I'm sure Azure has their own. The good thing about these is that they're so extensible. If you really wanted to, you don't need any of those other services. You can do everything you need to using just VMs. And so this is an example of an unmanaged service because the cloud provider isn't really doing anything other than provisioning the resources and then letting you do whatever you want to. And of course, they're not gonna like physically mail the VM to you. You're gonna be connecting to it remotely, probably via SSH. Now, what if you want to store some files, such as images, videos, and other types of assets that you probably need for your app? Yeah, you can store them on the VM and then serve them from the VM. That would work, but computers aren't specialized for handling files. So a better solution, a more scalable solution, and just more efficient in general is to use some type of file storage mechanism. On AWS, it's called S3, Simple Storage Service. It's basically an object store. That's what they're called. And so an object store is kind of like a black box, even though I've drawn it as like a white box here, but all you really do is read and write files to it. You can delete files, of course, but it's very simple. The interface from a programming perspective is really, really simple compared to manually handling files via like a VM. You don't worry about where they're being stored. You don't worry about allocating additional space. With a VM, you'll have, let's say like 100 gigabytes or something. You know, you try to upload a file and you run out of space. You don't have space. On cloud services, it's easy to get more space, but it's something you still have to kind of manage yourself as a developer. Well, object stores like S3 abstract all of that away for you. You'll never run out of space. You'll probably never need to do anything to scale your read and writes. Now, as you can imagine, these files are still being stored somewhere. They're being stored on a disk somewhere persistently. And to read and write the files, of course, you're using CPU and probably RAM. But again, you don't have to worry about that. This is an example of a managed service because AWS or your cloud provider is managing all the infrastructure for you. It's also sometimes called serverless, but it's not to say that there isn't a server involved. There definitely is. You can't do any of this stuff without computers, but it's abstracted away from you. And that's really powerful because all you have to do is worry about your application logic, reading and writing the correct files. You don't worry about the infrastructure at all.
It's obviously less powerful in the sense that you don't have precise control over what this service is doing, but you usually have enough control. Like if you wanted your files to be stored in a particular region, usually services like this will let you choose the region that you want to. They'll usually also automatically replicate files for you. So that's another benefit of using a managed service, because if we stored a file on our own VM, what if the VM dies or you know some type of hardware failure? Well, if you only stored it on one computer, you lose that data that was on that disk. Well, object stores solve this problem by replicating the files for you. Now, object stores are good for storing data, but they're not good at storing everything. What if you had actual application data, not files and images, but like you want to store your database data? Well, databases are really, really complicated. So you usually want to run some type of specific database software like MySQL or some other type of relational or non-relational storage. Like databases are basically just a really, really complex wrapper over these resources, particularly disk space. Well, of course, if you want to, you can just run your own MySQL on top of a VM and you can replicate it among other VMs if you want to, like create replicas of it. If you wanted to do sharding and scale your database like that, you can have some of your data split among the machines. That's doable, but it's complicated, isn't it? And so to solve this, cloud providers will usually give you a managed solution for storing your data, your database data. In the world of AWS, it's RDS, Relational Database Service. That's if you want a relational database. There's also Dynamo if you want a non-relational database. Once again, the whole point of using a cloud service for this rather than hosting your own database is because nobody wants to host their own database. Nobody wants to deal with those issues unless they have to. Now is a good chance actually to talk about proprietary software. In many cases, AWS isn't doing anything creative. They're actually just taking open source software, kind of like we discussed right now, MySQL or Postgres is open source. To solve this problem of making the user experience better is just to take open source software and then host it and make a managed service out of it. That's a lot of what relational database service does, but there is something else. DynamoDB, if you want to use this type of database, like this database service, you can only do so on AWS. So this is an example of proprietary software. If you built your app around DynamoDB and now you decide that it's costing you too much money, you want to move to a different service, well, you're going to have to migrate all of your data because AWS is the only one who offers DynamoDB. If you want to go to Google Cloud, you can't. And so this is commonly talked about as vendor lock-in. Generally, you don't want to be locked in, but recognize that it's probably not going to be a problem unless your app actually starts scaling. Because if you're spending like 100 bucks a month on DynamoDB, hopefully your company is making more than that much money. But if you start spending thousands and thousands, then it becomes an issue. And you'll also find that different companies have their own versions of databases. For example, Google's version of a DynamoDB would be either Firestore or Cloud Spanner. Microsoft has their own. Cosmos DB, I think it's called. I've never used it. The idea is that once you know about one service, you, you know about like one database that AWS offers, then going to a different cloud provider is pretty trivial because they have their own version. So once you know one, you've learned the others. Like every cloud provider has an object store. They all have a VM service. They all have their own proprietary or open source database services. I talked about how a lot of services just take open source software and then just make a managed service out of it. Well, one of the services that didn't do that was AWS. Lambda, commonly known as functions as a service. This was, in a sense, taking this CPU component, the compute component, like if you wanted to actually create an API or run some type of compute, not necessarily storing persistent data, you would use something called AWS Lambda and pretty much every big cloud provider has copied it. Google has cloud functions. I'm sure Azure has their own. But the idea is all you have to do, you don't worry about the infrastructure at all. You don't worry about the VM, the disk. You hardly worry about the CPU and the RAM. You can set like memory limits and things like that. But basically you take your code as a developer and that code is pretty much deployed for you. You don't have to worry too much about the environment 
You just take your code and it runs. Now, the problem with functions as a service, this is one of the most serverless services that you can do. And the reason I say that is because serverless is really a spectrum. There are services that are completely managed by the cloud. Lambda would be a pretty good example of that. And then there are other services like VMs that are not managed at all. And then there are database services which are half managed and half not. Sometimes DynamoDB is very managed, but the idea is that there's a spectrum and Lambda or functions as a service abstract away pretty much everything for you, but that does come with some downsides. For example, if you want to manage any type of state in your API, which is becoming less and less common with REST APIs and microservices, you probably won't need to do that. But if you do, you probably won't be able to use Lambda unless you use some type of external storage. Because when you run a Lambda function, you don't really have access to your disk. That's abstracted away from you. It can be good sometimes and sometimes it can be bad. So it depends on what type of problem you're trying to solve. But with Lambda, most APIs can be solved with this way. And if they can, why would you ever want to manage your own VM? It's a pain. So now if you just look at these four categories of services, you can build almost anything with these. The one big category I've probably been lacking on is networking. And I probably won't go super in depth into that. For example, like load balancers, CDNs, and things like that. But logic wise, we can do pretty much everything with these services. And you probably don't even need EC2. You don't need VMs because VMs, you can handle everything with anyway. But just looking at this, we have persistent file storage. We have persistent like application data storage and we have compute. We can serve our front end or our back end. Where we go from here is kind of opinionated. So there's two categories I kind of wanted to talk about. One is just observability in general. And I'm not an expert when it comes to AWS with observability, but I think the services are going to be pretty similar to Google Cloud, but it's about like your logging, your monitoring data, and your alerts. Being able to observe how your application is running via like server side logs or metrics. For example, if you want to see like how much CPU your VMs are using or how long your queries are taking, that would be monitoring data. And if you wanted to know, if one of these services went down for some reason or the latency got too high, you'd probably want to be alerted of that via some push notification in real time. So that's what observability is about. And the big cloud providers have done a decent job of giving you tools for observability, but there actually are other services such as Datadog. It's a relatively big company actually. And their whole proposition is that they can handle observability better than the big cloud providers, even though there's actually a bit more friction in using one of these external tools because there's more work involved in like setting up the monitoring agents and things like that. But generally speaking, People are big fans of services like Datadog because they make this stuff actually easier for you. It's not just that. When you think about something called data warehouses, the big cloud providers have, I think AWS's is called Redshift. Google has BigQuery and they do a decent job. Some of them do better than others. But even given that, there actually are other platforms like Snowflake, like Databricks that are basically companies dedicated to solving these problems. And if they're spending all their energy on one specific area, then they think, and in many cases they do, do better than the big providers. Tools like AWS have made development so much easier than it was 20 years ago where you needed your own servers. Still, people complain that AWS is really, really complicated to use. And so now there are companies like Vercel, which pretty much at a high level are wrappers around AWS. And I don't mean that as an insult because in a sense, AWS is just wrappers around like other open source software. The whole goal of these cloud providers is to give you an easier way to use use AWS resources, just like how these resources, RDS, functions as a service, they're just wrappers around VMs. Everything is just an abstraction on top of other things. And that's okay because the whole point is to make development easier. Now, lastly, I wanted to talk about the differences between regional and global services because it's kind of a buzzword. You see it thrown around a lot. The definition is kind of fuzzy 
For example, if we talk about a content delivery network, a CDN, well, that's inherently a global service because you have a world map and a CDN is basically just a distribution of servers around the world that store some static data usually. And so you can't really have a regional CDN. Now take the other side, take a VM, for example, VMs are inherently regional. You can't have one VM split in five different regions, right? You just have one VM in a location. You could have a second VM somewhere else and a third one somewhere else. And you know you could have these VMs under a load balancer serving traffic in different parts of the world. That's perfectly fine. The service itself is regional though, a VM is regional. Sometimes it gets kind of fuzzy if we're talking about databases like DynamoDB, or Google Cloud Spanner. And before I even get into those, let's just talk about a regular relational database service like RDS, and I think Google's is Cloud SQL. I really prefer the names in Google Cloud. They're just a bit more intuitive. But with a regional database service, you have your world map and you have your database service hosted in a certain region. Even though it can be partially managed, for example, like replicas, database backups, and a lot of things can be managed for you by the cloud provider, it's still in a single region and it'll be serving traffic probably around the world. So some places in the world are gonna receive data a little bit slower. Usually it doesn't matter though. But when you get into global databases, these are super, super powerful because they actually manage sharding and replication for you and they distribute your data all around the world. Even though it's distributed around the world, they will work together. Generally, your request will be routed to the nearest location. The power of a global database is huge. Even though most people probably won't need it, it is very powerful in just handling the scale for you and making the latency as small as possible because data is stored as close to the user as possible, kind of like with a content delivery network. And generally you'll find that global services usually cost more and managed cloud services also cost more because the more work that the cloud provider does for you, the more they're gonna charge you, of course. Sometimes it's worth it though. Like this is a very hard problem to solve. You probably don't wanna implement your own global database by yourself. You probably just wanna pay somebody to do it for you. This is a lot of open-ended discussion but I think that's what's most important. I could have gone into an example of one of these cloud providers, but looking at it from a high level, I think is most important and getting hands on with it, which is something we didn't do is something I'd also recommend to you. Like, don't just watch me talk about this stuff. Try using some of these services, try building an application out of them.